Hello, welcome back. Uh, welcome to lesson 35, chemical families. Now, uh, what you need to know first of all, I'm going to give you an overview. Uh, we're going to learn about the differences between two separate things. So kind of think of this as group one of things we're going to learn about. We're going to learn about metals, non-metals, and metalloids, right? So we're going to learn about non-metals, metals, or uh, non-metals, metals, metalloids. And it has to do with this little staircase in the periodic table, all right? So that's one thing we're going to learn about. We're going to learn where metals are located, where non-metals are located, and where metalloids are located, and a little bit about them. And then we're going to learn another way of looking at the periodic table besides metal, non-metal, metalloid. We're also going to look at it in terms of chemical families. So we'll talk about this here, 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 how they all behave. And you're going to learn some characteristics of this and this vertical column, and this vertical column, and some characteristics of this one, and this one. So we're going to look at metal, non-metal, metalloid, and then we're going to look at individual vertical columns and group those together as well. So you're just getting comfortable with how a periodic table is kind of laid out in different ways you can look at it. I hope you enjoyed the Bohr diagrams. So we're going to be looking at this. The slide is in the uh, Google Classroom for this lesson. So you can use this slide because in the, in the booklet, it's not that great of a photocopy. So this might be what you want to use for these lessons. Uh, you don't need to make any notes necessarily, but you got to pay attention. And the biggest part for this assignment is there's four separate things you need to read and do questions are. And at the end of this video, I'm going to lay out what questions you need to do as well as one extra picture you're going to need to look at. Um, so first thing you need to know, chemical families, let's take a look. We're going to look at metals, non-metals, and metalloids. Pretty cool. All right, so there we go. Of course, I can't fit that all in one sheet, but I'll do my best. There we go. Um, metals are found to the left of the staircase. So not these ones touching the staircase necessarily, but anything to the left of the staircase is a metal. Non-metals are found to the right of the staircase, and metalloids are found along the staircase right there. Okay, so that's the first thing you need to know, where they're located. But what are they? Tell me that. All right, and this is awesome. I normally make students copy this, but you have the handout, so lucky you. Uh, make sure you get this top part though, okay? Um, Metals are solid at room temperature, except for mercury, because remember, mercury is a weird one. Mercury is a liquid metal at room temperature. Pretty cool. Um, so metals are normally solid. Well, they, they are solid at room temperature. They're usually gray or silver. They're shiny. They're very good conductors of electricity. They are flexible, and they can be made into wire. Think about that again. That sounds like everything you kind of know about metal. So don't get too like, oh God, I gotta memorize all these things. This is just common sense, right? A metal is normally gray or silver. It's normally shiny. It's good at conducting heat and electricity. You can bend it and you could turn it into wire. We know that about metal and we know they're solids. Okay, now let's look at the non-metals over here. This is normally gases for the most part, right? Over half of them are gases at room temperature. The rest are solids except bromine. Uh, Non-metals are normally dull. They don't have a lot of luster or shine. They're very low on the shiny scale. Uh, they're usually very poor conductors. Uh, they're normally brittle, which means they break very easily. So they're kind of opposites, right? They're non-ductile. You can't turn a non-metal into a wire. It just doesn't work that well. So now, if you know what a metal is and you know what a non-metal is, guess what a metalloid is, this last column. It's kind of a blend in between. It's kind of like, eh, right? So metalloids are touching this staircase. You can see this staircase right here, right? Um, so metalloids are touching the staircase. They're located on both sides of the staircase and there's a good list of them. You can see all the symbol names for them. They can be shiny or they can be dull. So they're in between, right? Uh, they may conduct electricity. They're bad at conducting heat. 
they're brittle or crumbly and you can't really turn them into wire. So that's, that means ductile. Ductile means can you turn it into wire. So this is a really important idea to get the ideas of what a metal is, a non-metal is, and what a metalloid is right along that line. Okay, so that's cool. That's one way we could look at this periodic table. Now, we've got to look at it a little bit differently now. And this is a little more intense. So we're going to look, excuse me, uh, we're going to look at the families. So here's a family. This is a family. We're also going to learn about these families over here. All right. How many valence electrons does this one have? It always has one. How many valence electrons does this family have? Two. This one's always full. Over here, this one's always got full valence electrons. We're gonna use this because, um, think about it this way. If something just has one valence electron, it's gonna be really easy to steal that electron. If something has a full amount of electrons, it's not gonna to wanna to give any up. So this gets pretty cool. All right, let's take a look. So the first thing you gotta know is this family right here is called the alkali metal. So vertical groups on the periodic table are referred to as families because each group or family here acts the same way. So what about this family right here or group? The alkali metals. Tell me about them. They're the first group. They're extremely reactive. Uh, they're shiny, they're good conductors, they're malleable, they're soft, and they're so reactive that you have to store them specially. They're usually found with other elements in nature. You have to separate them because they're so reactive. They don't just sit in big chunks by themselves. They normally react with other things, and then you have to separate them to get them in a pure form. But these are the most reactive metals in the world. And you can see, like lithium, we use lithium in batteries. We use lithium because it's so reactive, because it only has one electron in its outer shell that we can play around with very easily. So that is some of the characteristics of the alkali metals. Now, let's take a look. We move over to the next family, the alkali earth metals right here. What are the alkali earth metals? They're reactive, but they're not as reactive, but they are still metals. And uh, they're not as reactive as these, and they have two valence electrons in their outer shell. Now let's jump over. We're gonna move over to the calcogens. That's just, all you need to know for that one is the name. So you need to know that this one here, the oxygen family, we call that the calcogens. Then we call the next group. So this is the calcogens, and this is the halogens right here, right? So alkali family, alkali earth family, calcogens, halogens. What about the halogens? They like to bond because their valence shell at the end there is almost full. It has seven out of eight electrons or it has 17 out of 18. And it's so close to being full that it really wants to bond with other things. So that's why this is so reactive. And that's also why this. So if you think about this, if this family needs one and this one only has one in its outer shell and they want to react, guess who would be very good friends? right? Fluorine and lithium, they could be really good friends, right? Chlorine and lithium or sodium, those groups are going to want to bond together equally. We'll get into that in a couple lessons, don't worry, but it's pretty cool to think about. Um, now we get to the last gases and these are the noble gases. I'll just put N-O-B. These are the snobs. They are noble. They are like royalty. Does royalty interact with the common people? No, they are royalty. So are the noble gases. They have a full valence shell. Do they need other electrons to make that shell full? If it could hold 18, they have 18. Do they need any more electrons? No, they're full. So they do not want to react with all the peasants. None of these, they don't want to react with them. They are happy on their own. They have a full shell of electrons in their last shell and they are good, right? Uh, I think they don't undergo chemical changes easily. They have full outer shells. They're very unreactive. Uh, and that's about it. Now, 
this is kind of cool, and this is kind of getting into what I was talking about with reactions a little bit, which is kind of where you're going to go. Chemical reactivity of an element is determined by the number of electrons in its last shell. So if we were doing, let's see here, if we were doing, for example, this diagram of calcium, how many electrons did it have in its last shell? It had two out of 18, right? Um, depending on the number of electrons in that last shell on a Bohr diagram that you draw, that's how reactive it's going to be, right? Um, this number can be determined by looking at the Roman numeral at the top of each group. An atom becomes very chemically stable when it's full. That's why the noble gases have a full outer shell. They don't react. Whereas this one only has one in its last two. So it's got a little more stability, very unstable. And same here. This only needs one more, so it's going to become very reactive. So this is a very reactive family, and this is a reactive family. So you could say the alkaline metals and the halogens are the most reactive. All right. And a couple things to ponder here now. Remember, your photocopy isn't that good, so you should be looking at this slide right now. Alkali metals are very reactive because they only have one electron in their outer shell. Alkaline earth metals are reactive because they only have two. Metals, now this is very important. You need to underline this. Metals give away electrons and non-metals take electrons. So this side of the periodic table, they give and they are going to take electrons. You need to know that too, okay? So... The calcogens are less reactive since they need to gain two electrons. Halogens are very reactive because they only need to gain one. Non-metals gain electrons in order to become stable. And of course, metals want to get rid of their electrons. Now, we're not talking about they just throw them away randomly to nothing. No, this is when they're reacting. So these are going to want to give and these are going to want to take. And we'll do that in the next lesson. You'll be looking at some of the reading you look at today. We'll dabble in that and it'll play around with it a bit, but for the most part, I just want you to get comfortable with the periodic table. So, that brings us to your assignment today. Um, I'm just gonna go back to that. What you need to do is go in the booklet, and I'm gonna break this down to you very easily. So, the first thing you're gonna have in your booklet is this page after the slides. The periodic table today, and you need to do, check it out, one, two, three, and four. You could take a look at why you might use um, chlorine or things like that to clean swimming pools. You can look at that if you would like. So you do one, two, three, and four. You take a picture of that. You submit it to me. You also then read this, right? And this is a little bit about Mendeleev and the different periodic tables. And of course, you will do on page, it says on the bottom here, page 105. You're going to do one, two, and three. Then... On 4.3, you are going to do 1, 2, 3, and 4. And the last thing you will do, oh no, two more things. You'll read 4.4. And at 4.4, when you get to page 113, you will do 1, 2, 3, and 4. You'll take pictures of all these answers. You'll keep submitting them to me for uh, this lesson, uh, lesson 35. And then the last thing you will read is this 2.2 thing and you will read and it kind of does more of the same stuff it talks about different families and things like that and you will look at one two three and four and you will take pictures of those and submit it to me so this is a two-day assignment you've got a lot of things to read but it's all basically in this it's overview of everything we've been looking at getting comfortable and familiar with the periodic table because once you're comfortable with it you could start combining atoms and making mixtures and compounds physical, chemical changes, and that's where we're going towards the next lesson. So you need to get really good at understanding the periodic table, understanding what those Bohr diagrams are and what they mean, and understanding the reactivity of certain things, because now we're going to start combining things in the next lesson. So take pictures of all the stuff that I told you to do for your questions today out of those four worksheets and submit them for lesson 35, and we're going to move on to lesson 36 tomorrow, which is elements and compounds, which is combining them. Take care.